Hey folks, well, here we are for our sixth pandemic lecture. Um, this is again, uh, Political Science 1P96, Political Theory Through Film and Literature. I am coming to you once again from the paperback paradise, uh, watched over by, well, let's see, no, here we go, watched over by uh, my son uh, and also uh, a few uh, of my uh, dogs who are no longer with me, but uh, they're you know, they're going to keep us company um, through this discussion. Um, as always, I recommend having a playlist uh, or some music going on in the background. Um, nothing too distracting, but something that uh, fits in well with what we're talking about. So for today, we're talking about feminism, finishing up our discussion of feminism, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft and Marilyn Fry and Bell Hooks. I think you can't find a better source or a kind of a be better uh, feminist um, piece of music today than Janelle Monet's Dirty Computer. Just go to the old YouTube, fire up Dirty Computer. There's actually a, a like a 48 minute uh, video that actually goes along. It's like all the songs in uh, Dirty Computer. Um, uh, it's called Dirty Computer and Emotion Picture, I think. Go to that, fire that up, or just have it playing on in the background, or some other Janelle Monet, or really anything else that you really want. I can't control that, and I'm not going to have a fake pause in here where I wait for you to load up the thing. I'm just going to keep going. Um, okay, uh, so since I mentioned being in the paperback paradise, let me also mention a uh, paperback, a couple of paperbacks. So one is Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower. I mentioned I'm going to have a virtual reading group email me if you were interested in this. This is going to be something that we're doing after class is over, and it's just to kind of get us through these pandemic times. So uh, do keep that in mind and email me uh, if you're interested. The other thing I wanted to mention is a fantastic work of science fiction. It's a trilogy. This is actually the third work in the trilogy, so don't go looking. Don't start with this. The trilogy by uh, Cixin Liu is called the Three Body Problem Trilogy, and so this is the third. So the first book is called The Three Body Problem. Um, it's really just a, a great work of science fiction for thinking about humanity facing a kind of um, uh, impending catastrophe. It is, it's not about pandemics or anything, it's, it has to do with aliens, but it's just a really a fantastic work of fiction. So highly recommend um, that you take a look at that. Okay, let's talk uh, Mary Wollstonecraft. So Wollstonecraft is the first really modern feminist. There are a couple other folks that we would say, Mary Astell would be one of them who we, we, we might call proto-feminists in early modern Europe, but really uh, it, it, it begins with Wollstonecraft. She's a political theorist. She was the mother of uh, Mary Shelley, uh, who uh, will be the science fiction author who writes Frankenstein, so there's always a science fiction theme to what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, Wollstonecraft was inspired by the events of the French Revolution, but saw that women were being left out. So she uh, responds to that with her own call for uh, uh, rights for women. Um, it's important also just in the context of this course that she is gonna defend a more conservative version of feminism than you might typically think of when you hear the term feminist. Um, and so uh, there's a, a conservative kind of religious Christian basis to her feminism. It is a little bit more individualist as I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and it's just important to see that feminism, like other ideologies, has multiple versions. There is no one you know, version of feminism. There's no one version of liberalism or one version of conservatism. Uh, so Wollstonecraft's uh, early feminism is actually a little bit more conservative. Not to say that it, you know, if she were born in the present that she would be necessarily conservative, but uh, in her time and place, if we translate that uh, into the present, it, it has uh, somewhat more conservative and certainly more um, religious aspects. Um, okay, so uh, uh, that was talking about slide, I should have mentioned, slide seven in the previous slides that I sent you in the, the pack on feminism. Um, then if you go to the next slide, which is uh, slide number eight, entitled Reason and Immortality. So as I was saying, there is this uh, religious conception of humanity that uh, is influencing uh, Wollstonecraft. And so she is going to give a metaphysical religious argument for women's equality. Um, and it's based on the idea that if women have immortal souls, they can't be denied equality. And so she lays out why it is that she thinks women, uh, you know, have immortal souls, and uh, indeed, you know, the Christian tradition, uh, you know, would tend to back her up on that. Um, so for Wollstonecraft, the idea is, look, um, you know, women are creatures of God. They are created by God. They are created by God in God's image, and so they possess rationality and freedom. 
Um, animals do not possess that kind of immortality. Anim according to her, animals do not have immortal souls. Um, and she takes these ideas about reason and immortality from a kind of Platonist Christianity, that is a, a Christianity influenced by um, Platonism, influenced by the Greek philosopher Plato, in the late 1700s in the England in which um, she's writing. So immortality is a possession of those creatures uh, who, you know, who, who are created by God in God's image. So that's all humans, uh, men and women alike. And it's having immortality and freedom that is really the kind of the purpose of being immortal. I mean, the, the part of the purpose is also to worship God uh, for her. But what you get as, as an immortal being and the reason for being given immortality is that you are given freedom and you are given rationality to make choices. All right. So if you look at slide nine, what does she think is wrong with the women of her day? Um, Wollstonecraft actually has a lot of nasty things to say about the women of her day. Um, I'm intentionally playing on the whole nasty woman uh, trope that uh, has become uh, sort of common in um, in politics, you know, through things that uh, Trump has said and, and, and others. Um, so she says very critical things about women. Uh, specifically, she says, look, women actually don't seem to be particularly rational. They seem to be just too sensitive or too emotional, too irrational. Uh, they only seem to focus, says Wollstonecraft, they only seem to focus on kind of momentary pleasures, on fashion, on kind of superficial materialistic things. Um, and in fact, they don't end up uh, trying to work very hard, they, they're not able to sacrifice their present interests in the moment for kind of long-term goods. Um, now, keep in mind that there's there's a kind of elitism to to the view that um, Wollstonecraft is um, is propounding here. But um, what she does is she draws on basically what people, especially Rousseau, who was very influential, and we, we didn't read Jean-Jacques Rousseau for this class, but he, he was uh, very influential in her thinking, and he and others criticized rich people basically on the same grounds. That the rich people are essentially um, superficial, materialistic, only interested in momentary pleasures. Wollstonecraft draws on that to say basically women are, are shaped and crafted like rich folks. So her point is, just as rich people are not uh, born that way, they're not born to be shallow and superficial and irrational, uh, they're a product of their culture, that being rich basically makes you superficial, so too being born a woman in that particular culture, the culture of her day, she thinks women are taught to essentially be superficial and irrational. So they're lazy, they're insipid, not because of their birth, not because of their biology, but because of the way that they are socialized in a kind of social straitjacket. Um, so uh, she is going to, so she offers lots of particular criticism of women and how women need to improve themselves, but also how there need to be these different social structures, including being granted political rights, which means the right to be represented, the right, you know, the right to vote, uh, the right to own property, a number of the basic uh, rights that we take, you know, right to freedom of association, right to freedom of speech, those sorts of things. That's, that's what she's talking about. Basically, she thinks women need to be allowed to struggle, to work, and to suffer rather than being sort of treated as these caged, uh, uh, you know, kind of caged, uh, caged bird, you know, uh, little ornamental birds that are so delicate that, you know, have to be protected and nurtured and, you know, not allowed to suffer, uh, not allowed to, to really challenge themselves. No, women need to be allowed to go out, test themselves, struggle, fail, suffer. Um, and it's only through engaging with the, the, the hardship of the world and struggle that women can actually improve themselves. Uh, and that improvement is going to be in accordance with their, their freedom. So their ability to make of themselves, you know, as, as they wish through the use of their rational minds uh, and in accordance with the fact that they have immortal souls just as men do. Um, so there is a kind of, you know, there are two levels to this. She is saying that there need to be different social structures and women need to be granted these uh, formal rights, right to vote, etc. But it's also about women as individuals uh, altering themselves. And so there is this, again, I mentioned that this kind of conservative element where she you know, directs a lot of her criticism at women specifically for allowing themselves uh, to be sort of uh, um, cared for, but really caged in this way, socialized and domesticated in this way. Um, and this, again, is similar to what we see some some conservative feminists talking about today. So conservative feminists, you know, can look back to Wollstonecraft and actually 
quite like a lot of what she says. Um, you know, non-conservative feminists are also very influenced by her, but not as directly in the sense that they don't take up the specific points and the per specific perspectives and the specific criticisms of the superficiality or uh, materialness, uh, materialisticness uh, of women. Okay. You go to slide 10. Uh, this is where we come up into more or less the present day. Uh, so the, the late 20th century uh, philosopher, Marilyn Fry. She uh, also thinks like Wollstonecraft that women's lives are stunted by oppression. Um, but she's gonna give a, a, a more kind of philosophically nuanced uh, perspective on this. Um, and it's, it's much more akin to uh, what we think of as kind of um, late 20th century or early 21st century feminism uh, with the critique of oppression. Um, so like Wollstonecraft, uh, Fry is going to argue that women experience the world through a set or a, a built-in set of social incapacities. So women are socialized to be incapable, not capable of doing things, not because of their biology, but because the society kind of wants them uh, to be created that way. Um, so in other words, women are taught not born to feel weak or dependent or less than men. Um, unlike Wollstonecraft, though, uh, Fry focuses not so much on women's role in maintaining this status, so she doesn't have a lot of criticism that she directs specifically toward women, Fry that is, um, but instead she's focusing on the system, right? So she, she's focusing on systemic constraints, what could be called patriarchy, what could be called syst uh, systemic misogyny or systemic sexism. Um, okay, move to slide 11. So this is oppression, right? This is what she is talking about. And so she, she wants to actually flesh out uh, what this concept really means. She says it's a nuanced concept. We need a nuanced concept um, because men do indeed suffer as well as women under conditions of the present uh, social organization. However, she says that is not oppression. It's suffering, but it's not oppression. So this is really crucial for her. And Fry is not saying that men's suffering is trivial or unimportant, but it doesn't have the same political meaning. It is not politically oppressive uh, as constraint or, or limitation or reduction because it doesn't have the kind of group nature that oppression has, that oppression of women has. So women are reduced to second-class citizens, even having a right to vote and a right to own property, right, which, you know, in most uh, liberal democratic uh, systems, obviously women, women have, formally they have those same set of rights. Um, but because women are habituated, Fry says, through, so, you know, social, cultural uh, habituation, habituated to still basically think themselves uh, less capable than men, um, they still have a kind of second-class status, even for all the, the gains that they have achieved. Um, and so women are in a better uh, situation now than they were, you know, 100 years ago or 200 years ago, for sure, but it still isn't enough, and there's still a kind of second-class status. She says, this is hard to see, and so this is where she really sees the value of the concept of oppression. Of oppression. This is hard to see because oppression functions like a birdcage. If you just look at one bar of a birdcage, you just say, well, the bird can just go around it, right? So there's just this one line or, oh, okay, maybe there's another, uh, you know, maybe there's another part of the cage. Well, the bird can just go around that. Well, you know, obviously a bird cage is made up of a whole bunch of, of uh, bars, uh, you know, going horizontally and vertically. Uh, Fry says this is the way oppression works, that if you just look at each individual uh, problem or each individual limitation or constraint on women, you can try to explain how that one thing is not that big a deal. Uh, and so women are still basically free um, because of all of these other freedoms that they have. But she says you have to pay attention to the way that all of these things, all of these various limitations work together to create a kind of large cage-like structure that is oppression. Um, okay, so on to uh, slide number 12 uh, entitled Door Openings and Double Binds. So Fry says, look at how uh, men will open doors for women. Now, this was much more common uh, when, you know, when Fry was writing this essay back uh, in, the, in the late uh, 1900s. Um, you know, but I think the, the point still stands today that there is still a kind of um, cultural norm around a man holding a door open for a woman in, in a way that, uh, that 
he's not expected to for another man. It's not nearly the way it used to be in like 1965 or something, but I think there is, there is still a little, a little holdover of this. Um, I say on the slide that I think a better example of this would be to think about the way that toy aisles um, or the, the setup of, of a toy store like Toys R Us is if you look at the way there is all of the boys' toys, which is, you know, the sort of, uh, Marvel comics and the Transformers and all that, you know, uh, the Marvel movies, I guess I should say. Um, all of the kind of superhero stuff, they're, they're like that's on the one side. And then on the other side, there's all the, they're the pink aisles. I didn't even go into those aisles because I have a boy. So I, I was, you know, doing my good uh, job as culturally constrained to like go get Transformer stuff and Godzilla stuff and whatever for my son. Um, he really does like Godzilla and really it's, Pacific Rim is probably, uh, you're, you're, you're not coming to me for what eight-year-old uh, boys like, but Pacific Rim, really giant robots and giant monsters, hard to, you know, hard to get any better than that, really. Um, here, I'm, but I'm just, you know, following in the cultural stereotypes uh, that, that uh, Fry is talking about. Anyway, my point is whether you're thinking about um, her example of the door opening or whether you're thinking about the, the kind of rigid gender stratification of the kinds of toys and that the way that they are separated in, in the toy aisles at, um, uh, at Toys R Us, um, in itself, in and of itself, these things don't seem to be a big deal. Um, but given the way that women, you know, given all the other pieces of the puzzle, Fry says, the way that women are socialized to be pretty, uh, to think of them and want to think of themselves as pretty, as nice, as deferential, as helpful, as kind, as sweet. Um, that should have been the slide that there is this, you know, that there is a real, um, uh, this is some, something I think that we still see today, the, the descriptor of women um, that, um, you know, frequently I, I hear uh, men or younger men giving when they want to describe a woman, their way of describing one whom they like um, not necessarily in a romantic sense, but just a kind of good, a, a good version of a woman is to say, oh, she's sweet. Okay. That, and again, in and of itself, being that one person being described as sweet, you say, well, you know, what should she be described as like horrible or something, uh, you know, bitter, would, would that be better? But the point is that all of these things function together. This idea that you, you know, you want to be seen as sweet, as nice, as pretty, as deferential, uh, helpful, etc. All of those things are damaging when it comes to how women as a group are treated and also how they think of themselves. Um, and so th they're socialized into uh, uh, what Fry refers to as a set of double binds where they get put in one category or another. Both of the categories really aren't very good, but there's not really a, a good third alternative. So thinking about... Um, uh, the double binds as uh, something like uh, a woman being defined as a doormat or a bitch, right? Where she's either s you know, totally complacent and so sweet that she has no independent personality, or if she is assertive, she is put into the bitch category. And there, there's not really an easy way to mediate between those two. You're the one or the other, but either way, you're not really a, a kind of full first-class citizen because you're in one of those, one or the other of those categories. Uh, similarly with kind of sexual politics or uh, sexual relations, uh, slut versus ice queen or Madonna versus whore. Um, you know, those double binds, you, you lose both ways. That's the point that Fry would make, that there, there isn't really a kind of reasonable third way or middle ground uh, for women. They, they get put into one or another of these boxes. So they're bound either way. Um, is the point. Um, okay, so for Fry, so this is the next slide, slide um, 13, um, this oppression uh, functions through the imposition essentially of a group identity. So women are not, and this uh, I think comes up a lot when we talk about identity politics today, and the claim is women are, at least sometimes the criticism of feminists is, is offered that women are uh, for feminists are essentializing women that they are uh, engaging in identity politics by claiming some essential identity to womanhood over against uh, men, uh, etc. Fry's point is precisely the opposite. Fry's point is there is an identity, a group identity that is imposed by culture 
uh, by the larger culture onto women. Women are not choosing this. This is not, you don't want to be put in the position of being in the double bind, of being a doormat or a bitch, of being a, 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 a slut or an ice queen. You don't want that. These are imposed on women as a group, not chosen but imposed. Um, so to the extent that there is an identity issue, um, Fry says, yeah, it's being imposed onto women. Women aren't Women don't want these these double binds. Women don't want uh, these oppressions. Um, so they're put into the, these kind of social straitjackets by their family, um, by social relations, by political institutions, and all of this results in a kind of general inequality. Now, um, feminism is is going to respond to this specific form of group based domination, but it isn't because it prefers women to men. That is not, for Fry, the point. Um, the point is that women as a group are oppressed by these based on a certain view of their biology, which is in fact a cultural construction of their gender, not actually their biology. And that uh, because of this, they are thought of as weaker, as more emotional, as less rational, less ambitious, kind of less deserving of full and equal consideration, even though they have many of the same formal, uh, formally for <laughs> They hate to have the same rights to formal equality in terms of the right to vote and that sort of thing. But those don't go far enough. That is the basic point that, that Fry and, and feminists who follow Fry are making. Okay, let's wrap up our, our discussion of feminism for uh, today with um, the... Um, oh, actually, what am I doing? I've got one, one more slide uh, with Fry. Um, so she talks about, um, this is the uh, slide 14, crying versus high heels. So, you know, again, she's sensitive to the point that men also have limitations or constraints placed on them by society. And she says, let's, let's think about the social taboo against um, men crying in front of men. She says that exists as a taboo, but it's not the same as the kind of physical restraint that women are forced into on a daily basis through something as minor as uh, wearing a pair of high heels. Which again, it's just as the as one little piece of the, the puzzle might not seem to be a big deal. The issue for her, again, is to say who as a group benefits from this practice. So for her, men as a group benefit from the taboo of no no men crying in front of men. So because it, it uh, depicts kind of culturally men as disciplined, as authoritative. Um, it still serves to reinforce men's status over women, the no male crying, even though she would acknowledge that, you know, it, it is, it's a taboo and it actually, it does harm men. There, there is suffering that this imposes on men that they are not able to share their emotions as freely as women. Um, but it serves a, a larger purpose of group control. And so this is why she thinks that that social taboo of no male male crying, while it causes suffering, it still doesn't count as oppression. Whereas uh, wearing high heels doesn't benefit women as a group. It still benefits male social control. Women uh, being socially acculturated or being acculturated to think of themselves as always needing to be sort of present for a male gaze uh, to be pretty, to be sexy, to be attractive in particular ways. So the kind of constraint of high heels for her is different. Conceptually, it's different from the kind of constraint of a social taboo like no male male crying. Um, so it's because the one augments male power or male status or male control, whereas, well, actually uh, both of them augment male status or control. So that's why uh, the, the social taboo where men suffer by not being able to freely express emotion is not oppression of men, although it is a bad thing, she would, she would concede. Um, but both of them, the high heels and the no male male crying, still um, aid and abet male power or male status. Okay, so now I have finished with Marilyn, Marilyn Fry. Two slides uh, just to finish up um, our, our feminism discussion, uh, and that is with Bell Hooks. Um, Bell Hooks is an intersectional feminist theorist uh, at uh, Berea College in Kentucky. Um, and she argues quite explicitly for a more inclusive version of feminism than Fry. Inclusive in terms of um, uh, race, uh, inclusive in terms of class, inclusive in terms of gender. Um, 
So she sees feminism as, uh, this is the quotation, feminism is a movement to end sexism, sexist exploitation, and oppression. So it's feminism as, as targeted to end sexism, and specifically sexist oppression. That, for Hooks, is really the issue. So sexism is the problem. It harms women more than men, she says, but it also harms men. So she would be more inclined to see that male-male uh, crying taboo that we were just talking about with Fry. She would be more inclined to, to point out the suffering as also part of the problem of sexism that also needs to be addressed. So she's going to include men and women uh, much more robustly and explicitly uh, as, as uh, targets for her concern than in the, the earlier version of feminism that we saw with Fry. Um, and women, she says, can also be sexist, so it is not something that is uniquely, um, um, uniquely the province of men to be sexist. So she also, as a number of our earlier thinkers in the kind of race and liberation section, uh, is going to follow Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, quest for a beloved community. Um, and so that is where, in the future, she hopes for, she seeks, she wants to... Uh, uh, mobilize for a community where there is no domination based on race, based on gender, based on class, based on imperialism. All of those things, she says, should be our targets as feminists. So she thinks feminism includes all of these other things, and this is why it's an intersectional feminism. Um, uh, and so our final slide uh, to wrap up our discussion of feminism for today um, she points out, Hooks points out, the way that uh, the early movement. Feminism, especially in the 1960s, uh, that there were some feminists who were uh, almost exclusively anti-male. She thinks that is basically a caricature, but it's a caricature that has held over into the present. So Hooks knows that a lot of people, when they hear feminism, they still think you hate men if you're a feminist. Uh, and, you know, she is at pains to point out that that is not, in fact, the case, that there were a couple of thinkers in the early wave of feminism uh, and, you know, one or two who, who go on after that, uh, who, who are more explicitly anti-male, but that, that, that in general, that is not what feminism is about. And it certainly does not apply to Hooks's. She is explicit about that. Um, but she says there were a number of other problems with early feminists. And as much of a problem is that they, the early feminists, in, that is in the 1960s, in the 20th century, um, were predominantly white and were predominantly middle class. So they essentially left out and neglected the struggles of uh, working class women and also women of color. Um, so she is as much interested in criticizing those feminists from the 1960s for their classism and for their implicit racism, not necessarily explicit racism, but for the way that they essentially were only talking to this one group of upper class white women. Uh, and intersectional feminism since Hooks has, has really continued this, so you, this is a, a fairly common uh, aspect of intersectional feminism uh, at the present. Um, so these women, she says, mainly just wanted reform. They essentially wanted to collude with the capitalist system. So they didn't have a serious critique of capitalism. They didn't have a serious critique of racism. They didn't have a serious critique of imperialism, especially American imperialism in the 1960s. Again, Hooks is, is uh, talking in this American context. She says these early feminists, they, they weren't talking about any of these things. So their feminism was essentially just collusion with the upper classes in uh, capitalist America. They were just trying to get included into the upper class of capitalism. They weren't actually challenging uh, any of the myriad other forms of oppression that were going on in society at that time. So she is she absolutely targets those as central problems with that earlier version of feminism, as well as the fact that it also neglected um, the suffering of men. So, um, so she's going to argue for a kind of revolutionary feminism. Now, this doesn't mean that it, this is explicitly violent, but she wants a revolutionary change. It can be a peaceful revolution, um, but it is it is a change that needs to occur across a whole set of sy uh, systems of power, class power, race power, uh, gender power. Um, we could also throw in, uh, I don't think she mentions that it's in this piece, but we could think about uh, disability and, and the way that uh, ableism uh, is empowered or ableism as a kind of power structure, and also ageism, uh, a number of other power structures I think she would also say would have to be included, and indeed intersectional, a number of intersectional feminists you know, include um, these other struggles as well. And of course, uh, LGBTQ struggles also have to be figured in here. Um, 
So basically where we come to at the end of our feminist section is, is, is what Black Lives Matter is saying. So Bell Hooks's version of feminism, which you know she's, she's writing quite a bit earlier than Black Lives Matter, but this is essentially what Black Lives Matter is talking about when they explicitly uh, link themselves to feminist, um, anti-imperialist, um, anti-capitalist or socialist critiques of capitalism uh, and, and LGBT, LGBTQ uh, and also um, anti-settler colonial uh, oppression. So, you know, so Black Lives Matter linking themselves with indigenous struggles uh, for liberation. Um, all of these things are basically prefigured uh, or, or are, there are earlier versions of this in what Hooks is talking about. And so I think you can see Hooks and Black Lives Matter as being really um, uh, connected quite centrally. Um, okay, so that uh, finishes up pandemic lecture six. Um, see me on the other side. I will be talking about Princess Mononoke, uh, about COVID, um, about green politics. Okay, take care of yourselves, take care of each other.